Amen. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, um, take them. We're going to take a little detour from the book of Acts and turn to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. We're, in fact, going to be reading the same verses that uh, we just read with uh, the children. 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to meditate today in this passage, verses 7 and 8, but also travel through the Scriptures at a few other passages of Scripture. So 1 John chapter 4 and verses 7 and 8. And if you don't have a Bible with you, I want to invite you to open up one of the ones in the pew there and follow along with me as I read the passage of Scripture aloud. And if you would, I ask that you please stand as we honor the reading of God's holy word. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. You just follow along with me as I read these two verses aloud. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. Lord, we thank you for the book of 1 John. God, we thank you for the Word of God. And now, Father, as we seek to get better acquainted with this passage and some others similar, we ask that you this morning would open our eyes, open our ears, and God, most of all, we pray you'd open our hearts so that we can receive the precious, preserved, powerful, words of the living God. Father, I confess that I need you this hour more now than I ever have. And Father, I pray that you'd empower me with your Holy Spirit. God, cleanse me from all sin and use me as a clean, holy, and pure vessel for your honor, glory, and praise. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. There's a little phrase that I want you to take note of found in the eighth verse and also found in the seventh verse. Uh, about middle ways in the, the seventh verse, it says, For love is of God. But then in verse number eight, the Bible closes with these three words, God is love. And if you are, mar make a habit of marking in your Bible, I'd like for you to mark the phrase, God is love. And I would like to adopt those three words and label them as the title of my message this morning. God is is love. By means of introduction, I decided to go to Google. And you know how that is. Sometimes it can be good and sometimes it can be bad. But I decided to go to Google and type in the top 10 Valentine's Day gifts. And uh, I began to research this and this is what Google told me. Google said that in the top 10 Valentine's Day gifts, one of them, this is in no specific order, but these are just 10 of the most common gifts for February the 14th. Chocolate, flowers, a romantic getaway, some type of lingerie, a necklace, perfume, a spa day, a silk robe, an iPhone, and diamond rings. I was shocked when I saw the iPhone. That was crazy. But what I was more shocked about was not seeing cards. I don't know about you, but the majority of the people that I, am, uh, that I know in my life for Valentine's Day ever since I can remember, roses, cards, and chocolate were mixed in on Valentine's Day. I would li like you to, to know this. I thought this was pretty cool. My wife did not want any chocolate. My wife did not want any flowers. And my wife did not want any cards. My wife is awesome. I spent absolutely nothing yesterday on my wife. Some of you are going to get that a little later. Anyways, uh, with that in mind, I, 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 I don't know about you, but, but growing up in high school or middle school, whenever you have the, the, you know, he likes her, she likes him, you begin to write those little letters to one another. And I'm sure that you can remember one of the first times you ever got a love letter. And you read it, and you probably read it and read it some more. But I want to share with you this morning that God has written us a love letter, and it's called the Word of God. It's called the Bible. And within these uh, words, the Bible tells us that yes, God is a loving God. I can hear the skeptics crying now. Well, the Old Testament presents God as a God full of wrath and a God that kills 
and a God who isn't loving. But the New Testament appears that God is gracious, God is merciful, and God is loving. Well, I must say this, that whenever you read through the Old Testament and you find where individuals are being killed, that is the nation of Israel or anybody else, it's a direct result of them not obeying the Word of God. God told them, if you obey my words, then my blessing will be upon you. But if you do not obey my words, then my cursings will be upon you. And sometimes throughout life, all the way from the Old Testament till now, God's judgment is upon those who do not keep His Word. But with that in mind, the Bible tells us that God demonstrated His love to us by sending the second person of the Trinity, that is Jesus Christ, here to this earth, to die on the cross of Calvary for our sins so that we could experience the love and forgiveness of Almighty God. The Bible says in that great verse that we all have memorized, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I submit to you today that from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, the Bible describes God as a loving God. Why? Well, because the Old Testament looked to the cross and now that Christ died on the cross, we as New Testament believers look back to the cross to read and look at how God displayed His love to humanity. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth, this word commendeth, all it means is, is to display or to demonstrate or to make known. God commendeth His love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I am thankful for that verse because I don't, I don't know about you, but, but whenever I look into the mirror every morning when my hair is going all sorts of directions, I'm reminded that I am nothing more than a sinner who's been saved by the grace of Almighty God. I'm reminded of that passage in Romans chapter 8 where it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 John chapter 4 tells us in verse 10, Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. This word propitiation is a little intimidating to most of us, but all it means is substitution. That Jesus Christ became our substitute many years ago, and that is how God demonstrated His love to us. And this word propitiation not only gives the connotation that Christ is our substitution, but that when Christ was on the cross, the wrath of God was totally pleased. And now when we put our faith and trust in Him, He is totally satisfied. And His blood will be our atonement. I want you to notice verse 14 of 1 John chapter 4. It says, We love Him because He first loved us. With these verses in mind, I have a key statement that's found in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 that I'd like to relate to you today. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. God is love according to our passage today. But my question for you, church, is do we love God? God has loved us, but do we love Him? I'm sure you're asking a question in your mind right about now. What happens when we love God? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I want to answer that question within the sermon today. I would like to answer that in three Statements, as I was meditating here in this passage and some other passages about the love of God, I wrote down this statement. When we love God, we will keep His Word continually. When we love God, we will keep His Word continually. 1 John chapter 2. In fact, I, I just submit to you today that the book of 1 John is all about God loving us and us loving God. And then... Us loving one another. 
1 John chapter 2, will you turn there with me? Verses 3 through 6 displays to us what happens when we love God. It says, and hereby. So verses 1 and 2 talks about how Christ is our propitiation, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So, so Jesus Christ, when He came and died on the cross, He made it possible so that every man, every woman, every boy, every girl that's ever existed or ever will exist could spend eternity with God in heaven. So He goes on and says, and hereby... We do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Now, this word keep throughout Scripture is when you study in the Old Testament and New Testament. Sometimes it gives the connotation that we're going to keep it. We're going to guard it. But this is not what it's implying here. This is implying that when we keep His commandments, that we're following them and we're obeying them regularly and continually. The Bible goes on to say, He that says, I know Him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, I want you to notice, this is not found in Second Opinions, chapter 5. This is found in the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 4. And in verse 5, it says, But whoso keepeth his word, that is, obeys it, and continually follows it, in him verily is the love of God perfected or completed. It says, Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. When we love God, does it mean that we're never going to sin? No, that's not what it means. But what it means is that when we love God, we will seek to continually to obey his word. And when we do fail, we confess it to him. I want you to notice in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, notice what the Bible says about the love of God in correlation to us keeping His commandments. He says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. That is, we're not going to be grieved as in uh, the process of death when we keep His commandments. In fact, when we keep His commandments, it brings liberty and great um, uh, uh, mental health and spiritual health. But when we do not keep God's commandments, they become grievous to our souls. I, I don't know about you, but if you've, ever, if you've ever broken God's commandments before... I mean the Holy Ghost conviction begins to get upon me. And I just have to go to my closet and say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me of my sin. This morning, I wonder, does this verse speak of us? That, that, that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. I submit to you today that when His commandments are grievous, when they bring grief to our lives, is when we are not fully obeying His Word. Notice, James chapter 1, the great wisdom book of our Bible, tells us this about the Christian life. James chapter 1, verses 21 through 27 says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. All that means is, is things contrary to God's Word. And receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. Now, I just want to just uh, take a little detour right here and let you know that it's not my word that ever saves anybody. It's not Pastor English's word that ever saves anybody. It's not Preacher Lycan's word that saves anybody. It is the word of God that saves somebody. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, so listen, if somebody stands up in a pulpit and does not display the word of God, if they display the opinions of man, then I declare that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not being proclaimed. When we proclaim the word of God, whether we start in Genesis or whether we start in Revelation or wherever we go, at some point, we'll find Jesus Christ in the midst of the passage. And we can preach and proclaim him. So, so the word of God is which, a, which is able to save our souls. Have you received it? Has it saved your soul? When? We become Christians. Notice what verse 22 and following says. It says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man, or if any person, or if any lady, it says, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man 
he was. Let's go back to middle school. And we're sitting in class, we're sitting by our best friend or, or maybe, maybe a significant other. And we begin writing notes one to another and, and we begin chuckling in class. And the teacher calls us out and says, Brian, will you just stop talking? You're disrupting my class. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so. And we go right back to it um, and just doing the same thing over and over again. And, and, and Brian, will you stop? You're disrupting my class. Sometimes the teachers will grab those notes and read it before the class. And hallelujah, thank you, Lord Jesus, that never happened to me. It happened to some of my friends, and I was laughing the entire time. Anyways, um, with that in mind, just as, as a teacher would try to calm me down in class, and I just said, no, I, I don't care. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. So-and-so. But I'm just going to continually doing what I'm doing. That's what the Bible's saying here. That when we say, when we hear God's Word on Sunday morning, and we go out in our lives... Many times, it goes in one ear and right out the other in each of our lives. But the Bible says that we are to be hearers and doers of the Word. So, when we love God, we will keep His Word continually. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. Do you love God today? God is love. May I give you a second statement this morning about what happens when we love God? When we love God, yes, we will keep His Word continually. But secondly, this morning, when we love God, we will love people consistently. When we love God, we will love people consistently. Notice 1 John. Yes, it's all about God loving us and us loving God, but it's also about God's people loving God's people and anybody else for that matter. The two great commandments is love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Notice what 1 John 3.10 says. Will you look at that with me? It says, In this, the children of God are manifest. This word manifest, all it means is to be made known. And the children of the devil. So, what he's about ready to say is comparing and contrasting those who are children of God and those who are not children of God. And he says, Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. When we love God, we will love people continually. Did you know it is easy to love those who love you? I mean, let's face it. If you love me, I'm going to love you. I mean, and if, and if I love you, you're going to love me. But if I say I, I don't like you or I don't love you, well, then it makes it a whole lot easier for you not to, to love me. Or if I say, oh, oh, you don't love me? Oh, I don't love you. That's just the way it's going to be. I mean, that, that's, that's how life is. And it's so easy to get caught up into that trap. But the Bible tells us that no matter if somebody hates us or no matter if somebody loves us, we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Just imagine Jesus Christ walking on this earth. People walk up to him and they hawked a loogie and spat right in his face. How would you treat that individual? Well, I'd, I would get in my flesh. I mean, Lord knows... I would get in my flesh and hawk up a loogie and spit it right back at him. <laughs> I would like to say I wouldn't, but you, you know how it is. When the flesh gets the best of us, only no telling what we'll do. If somebody walked up to you like they walked up to Jesus Christ and they nailed a stake into your foot, what would you do? Well, you wouldn't be able to go anywhere. You'd be trapped. <laughs> if somebody walked up to you and slapped you in the face or, or shoved a crown of thorns into your head... What would you do? What would I do? Like I said, it's easy to love those who love us. But Jesus Christ, our Lord, our example, displays to us that when those individuals do not love us, love them back. Isn't that what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, pray for those who despitefully use you and bless those who persecute you. He says, love your enemies. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, our text, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, 
Why should we love one another? For love is of God. So if we claim that, yes, I'm a Christian, I've been bought by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. Well, if we say that, then our actions towards one another should display that. And what I mean by that is, is we are to display love towards one another. And it says, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. That's a hard statement to swallow. You know, a lot, of, a lot of pastors, a lot of ministers, a lot of theologians will say, if somebody's having a question about their salvation, to go read the book of 1 John. Because within the book of 1 John, it's, it displays to us the Christian life in its simplest form. Love God and love each other. And if we're having trouble doing that, then it could be possible that we are not truly born again children of God. The Bible goes on to say in verse 12 of 1 John chapter 4, it says, No man has seen God at any time. Now this verse means in His full Shekinah glory. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, but He came in likeness of man and was not in the full Shekinah glory of Almighty God. And it goes on to say, If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected or completed in us. And then verse 20 Right after it says we love him because he first loved us, it says, verse 20, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So the Bible likens, I mean, just the, the terrible crime of murdering somebody with a knife or with a gun or with whatever. It says that if we just hate somebody, we've committed murder in our hearts. I mean, I just must confess that all of us are classified at some point in our lives, all of us, whether we're in grade school and, and somebody stumped our toe or, or we had a bad day and we said, quote, I hate you, unquote. Whenever we say that, we're displaying that, that, that we've murdered that individual within our hearts according to the Word of God. The Bible tells us that when we love God, we will keep His Word continually. When we love God, we will love people consistently. And all that means is that we'll love those who love us and love those who do not love us. May God help all of us today. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. God is love today, church. Do you love God? We discovered what happens when we love God in two ways. But now, let me transition and give you the third and final attribute of what occurs when we love God. When we love God, we will keep His work continually. When we love God, we will love people consistently. But thirdly and finally, when we love God, we will speak the truth compassionately. When we love God, we will speak the truth compassionately. There's one thing that's missing within the Baptist movement, I believe. Especially our particular spot within the Baptist movement. That is, we will stand up here and, and proclaim to the world that if you do not trust Christ as Savior, you're going to be damned to hell for all eternity. Now, that's true. That is true. The Bible declares that. But what I'm concerned about, Pastor English, is when preachers stand up here or, or anybody stands up and, and is enjoying the fact that people are going to slip off into hell for all eternity. But today, what is missing within the Baptist denomination and the Presbyterian denomination and every other denomination of size, shape, and color and flavor is this word, compassion. Where's the compassion within our pulpits? Where's the compassion within our Sunday school classrooms? Where is the compassion within the congregation? Well, it all stems from our love for God. And if we love God, then we will share His Word and the truth of the, the Scriptures 
full of compassion. Jesus Christ tells us in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And Matthew chapter 14 and verse 14, the Word of God tells us this about Jesus Christ. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them and healed their sick. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 27, the Word of God tells us this. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Here, about, <coughs> excuse me, this is the, the context of the parable of the unmerciful servant. One was merciful to, to the, his master was merciful to him, but then he goes and he is unmerciful to, to those who are serving him, which is total hypocrisy. But the Bible says that this one showed compassion. And then in Mark chapter 1, a parallel passage through the book of Matthew, in Mark chapter 1 and verse 41, the Bible tells us that, that when Jesus Christ saw the multitude of people, he was moved with compassion. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15 tells us, speaking the truth in love. This word compassion, we, we've discussed it time and time again over the years, but, but all it means is to pity. So, so when we have compassion upon somebody, we, we pity their situation and we want them to know the truth. And whenever we begin to em sympathize or, or empathize with somebody, we begin to pity them and show compassion. And that's what Jesus Christ did to sinful humanity. And since Jesus Christ did that, He's calling us to do likewise. So church, do you believe God is love? I mean, do we believe that God is love today in the congregation? Is God love? Yes, He's love. Well, then if God is love, then God's people should be full of God's love. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. God is love. Do you love God? Hey, when we love God, we will keep His Word continually. When we love God, we will love people consistently. When we love God, we will speak the truth compassionately. God is love. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the fact that your scriptures wholeheartedly, consistently proclaim that you are love. And Lord, we ask that you help us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Father, help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Father... Help us to keep your word. God, help us to love people. And God, help us to speak your truth with love. Father, we commit the rest of this service into your hands, asking that you'd have your will and your way. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with me as we sing a song of invitation?